when I was younger, like uh, very young, six or seven, my family was one of the first uh, to receive some new technology, cable television. We had no need for HBO or anything like that because we had JJ's video rental out on Broadway for that. What we did need, what my six-year-old mind needed, was only two channels, Disney and the Discovery Channel. On Disney, I was fascinated by the reruns of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the one uh, with James Mason and Kirk Douglas. I reveled, uh, as I still do, um, with the idea of the submarine voyage in the Pacific and the excitement of the adventure. And on Discovery, it was space. It was Mercury, um, Atlas, Gemini, and Apollo. And some of you might be saying, well, these are two things that should not necessarily go together. One deals in cartoons and fantasy and myth, and the other is supposed to be about science and technology. And yes, the voyage under the sea and the voyage to the moon are both from Jules Verne, but at the end of the day, one is soft story and the other is hard fact. It wasn't until much later that I saw how closely these two things were related and not just by a French author. Because even though the seven-year-old me saw the adventure of the Nautilus and the adventure of the Apollo missions, they are both inextricably tied together by death. In both, death lurks in the background. Why does Captain Nemo co go to the land, to go to the seas, uh, to renounce land and civilization? Because his wife and son were tortured and murdered by what he calls that hated nation. The whole story is predicated on one man's vengeance. Captain Nemo may be a brilliant engineer and science, scientist, but he's also haunted by the ghosts of his family. So to our own voyages into space and beyond, maybe you, like me, watched in real time as the Space Shuttle Challenger disintegrated 73 seconds into flight and took the lives of all seven crew. I don't know when I became aware of the Apollo 1 fire, the first real disaster of the space program, but I know I cried when I watched the first episode of From the Earth to the Moon and the vivid depiction of Ed White, Gus Grissom, and Roger Chaffee banging on the hatch as flames engulfed the interior of the craft. So maybe it's a good thing I didn't know about those when I was seven. Death hangs on us all. Since Adam's fall, we walk with a weight tied to us. And it's the weight of the awareness of our own mortality. And perhaps this Good Friday, more than any Good Friday in my memory, we are acutely aware of the reality of death as it relates to each of us individually and corporately. We are, in a very true sense, hiding from death. We live in a time when our globalized and integrated economies that have brought so many out of poverty and destitution and into prosperity and wealth and health are now the drivers of the death of thousands. Like a spacecraft that catches fire or a submarine turned into the destroyer of human life. On Good Friday, humanity remembers the lowest point in human history. We've murdered the Son of God. There is no human institution in this narrative that escapes. We tell ourselves that our governance is what keeps us civilized. Our laws and our courts direct us towards justice, and we see how false that can be. No one does good. We are reduced to either a baying mob, a cowardly governor, or sinners whose only response is to stand stock still and watch as the Son of God dies. As Psalm 14 reads, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. 
together they have come corrupt. And there is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who beat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? We set aside Good Friday during these three days as a special time to reflect on the death of Jesus. But we are not really preaching the good news if we don't also point out that this is our status throughout the year, that sin consumes every one of us, every institution, every cute child, every loving grandma, everything we take pride in as a civilization. We, this is our status every single day. But... Jesus still comes alongside. He hops in with us on the rocket, and he climbs in the submarine. He travels with us, experiences the world with us, even death at our own hands. We cannot say that Jesus accomplishes the reversal of death. We cannot say that, the, that, the, that death is defeated if we don't also say that Jesus tangles with death. If Jesus does not die, if he does not fight death, then Jesus doesn't defeat death. We cannot say that Jesus is the true, truly incarnate Son of God if Jesus does not die, because this is the way that death dies. Someone else has to take our place. Someone else has to tangle with death. It's in that tangle with death, that experience of death, that Jesus frees us from death. The one who is betrayed reconciles. The one who has no reason to forgive forgives. The persecuted one who has no reason to love loves. The one who should not die dies. What was once shadow has become real. Death has died. Amen.